Well, we are at 12 noon here, so let's get ourselves rolling. Uh, start up with prayer requests. If you haven't heard, Pastor Bauer um, came out with a rash Saturday. It was pajama day at work for him on Monday. He just wore a sweatshirt and wasn't dressed up. He said, I got this rash. I think it changed soaps. Went to the doctor yesterday. Nope, he's got shingles. So um, he's in the uncomfortable stage right now. So he'll be out the rest of the week. Hopefully he'll be back on Sunday. So remember Pastor Bauer and uh, others in prayer this morning. Definitely. Yeah. Rocky, I yeah. Other prayer questions? Friend from Sioux Falls area. Well, do others. Uh, Mike Schultz, pastor, he's not doing very well. Supposed to have a surgery, but is too weak to have surgery right now. And uh, that's Schultz. 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 Yeah, I'm not sure what it's. it's okay. Others. Thank you. Thanks for God's word. Uh, that's going to be a theme of our study today, as we see the importance of of binding ourselves, of tying ourselves to to where God reveals Himself to us, and that's in His Word and in His sacraments. And uh, we just can't be certain that He reveals Himself to us uh, apart from that. And oftentimes, it's not His Holy Spirit that's revealing these things, uh, but a different Spirit. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your your son, Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh, and most especially for his word and for the work of your Holy Spirit that uh, led the holy evangelists and apostles and prophets of old to write down Holy Scripture for our benefit and learning that we might come to know you. We might be brought to eternal salvation uh, through the work of your son, Jesus Christ. I uh, grant that we and all Christians who bear your name might look to your word and your word alone for all truth, guidance, and consolation and comfort in this life and in life to come. We ask for you to have mercy, we pray, and strengthen Pastor Stoltz that he might have surgery. Um, uh, do not, no one praises you from the grave, as, as, as David said, and so preserve Pastor Stoltz's life that he may continue to praise you by the work you've given to him, by preaching your word. Uh, we ask for you to continue to guard over the, uh, the well-being of Mark's friend Liz. Um, ease her heart and mind of all the, the assailments of the devil and, uh, and grant her healing. And, and fill, your, fill uh, the hole in her heart and whatever she's looking for with the love of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask for you to bless Pastor Bauer and grant him a speedy healing from, uh, from this ailment. And also that you would bless Josh and Kari as they seek to sell their house. Um, uh, please let their house sell to, uh, to some good neighbors. And, um, and, and bless them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> All right, well, what I have for you today is not a fancy PowerPoint. I don't know how teachers do that. PowerPoints take so long to put together. I've gotten faster at it, but I'm no, no professional by any means. So what you have today is just a simple printout for your um, glazing over nap time after lunch. <laughs> Lots of words there and kind of some deep stuff. But I thought I'd take the opportunity during this lunch and learn uh, to maybe go a little bit deeper than just uh, oh, God loves you, God loves everybody, everybody's okay, uh, sort of surface teaching that sometimes you get from different Christian preachers. And uh, I have two different videos for you. Uh, the first one, I'm, I'm sorry, it's it's a video recording of the 2019 ELCA National, sorry, uh, Nationwide Assembly is what it's called. It, when, when did you guys become members here? 21, 20? Something like that? Three years. Three years ago. So 21 it was. But I remember watching this uh, in, back in 2019. I was just in my office and I knew the ELCA convention, their uh, churchwide assembly is what it's called, was happening in Milwaukee. Yeah, I'm from Wisconsin. And uh, so I just had the, 
uh, convention proceedings on the background as I was as I was going along my business. I oddly enough like to do that. Anybody who's been to a national convention knows it's so boring. You need two picks to keep your eyes open. But I knew what was on the docket, and I what on the docket for that day was what's called an interfaith. Um, it was called the Declaration of Interreligious Commitment, which ended up passing at their churchwide assembly that year. Uh, but I had received a copy of it, you know, through different sources on the internet. And there were some weird things in there, like types of language that we in Missouri Center don't use. They, they continue to refer to the curiosity, uh, that we must have a posture of curiosity to kind of wonder whether or not God lets other people who are not believers in him, like uh, like the Buddhists, like the Mormon, like the Native American spirituality, like uh, Muslim, uh, like Hindus and so forth. If God's love is so great and his, his reach is so broad that, that he welcomes all of those apart from his son, Jesus Christ. I really scratched my head and said, well, how in the world can, can this be? You know, it was really far, kind of far afield from anything I learned growing up as a Lutheran and certainly anything I learned at the seminary. So I have a video there uh, in just a little bit. I'll be skipping around in the video, but the purpose of it is to help you understand some of the definitions that I got written out on our, on our sheet here for us today. I'm gonna, uh oh. So if you wanna turn to that handout that I placed before you, bear with me here as I share it on the screen for anybody. He wants to. Well, I want. Okay. All right. All right. So it's up on the screen and then also on your handout here for you. Make it bigger. <coughs> so there's uh, just a number of definitions here. This ties into our second video from uh, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. So there are four kind of uh, main challenges or heresies to the Christian church here in America. And Pastor Wolf Mueller in his book, Has American Christianity Failed? He outlines these to a greater degree. I'm just taking kind of a high level look. So revivalism is, is this. It's generally renewed religious fervor within a Christian group, church or community, but primarily a movement in some Protestant churches to revitalize the spiritual ardor spirit movement of their members and win new adherents. And some rights, it's this, this is the belief that lives need to be changed by faith in Christ. And so at the heart of revivalism, ah, it, it fascinating. A couple of years ago, I was visiting the Lutermans, and Larry, who, who loves to read stuff, and he's his, his kind of a history buff. He's from white area, and so is, um, so is to well, and had the history of white. And I was paging through there, and they got pictures of, you know, blizzards when they, they dig out the train. They also had this uh, story about revivals. In the early 1900s, a revivalist preacher came through and they put up this building almost overnight, just tar paper kind of barn looking thing, and they had revivals in there. And, and at the heart of the, the revivalist heresy is this, is that what you need to do is you need to look to your faith to know that you're a Christian, which is kind of the opposite of what we believe. Who do we look to to know that we are a Christian? We look to Jesus and his words to us. But the revival, revivalist says you got to look at yourself, your works. And then, you know, if you're out there sinning, you may be not a Christian. If you're out there struggling with something in your life, uh, maybe you're not a Christian. So what you got to do is you got to come up here to the mourner's bench. You got to cry. You got to give your life to Jesus. You got to have this special <laughs> spirit come upon you, this revival. And then you know that you really are a Christian because you kicked your drinking ways or you kicked the, the, the melancholy that you have of depression, whatever it may be. So the belief of the life needs to be changed in Christ. That's Actually detrimental, uh, Wolf Mueller argues, to the Christian church. The second is pietism here. Come on down. Pietism started over in Germany. Its influential religious reform movement began among German Lutherans in the 17th century, so 1600s. It emphasized personal faith 
against the main Lutheran church's perceived stress on doctrine and theology over Christian living. So uh, pietism is, is my faith, my personal belief, my, my testimony can even come out of that. And my personal belief then stands above scripture, is, is this. My belief stands above the doctrines, the teachings of the Lutheran church because they're you know too legalistic or too cumbersome. Um, but if God reveals something special to me, I'm going to believe that, even though it might not yeah. fall in line with Holy Scripture. So there's different strains of pietism, but that's uh, that's enough for it. So thirdly, here is mysticism, which we talked about last week. Some uh, <laughs> contact with the divine or the transcendent God above you, often understood in Christ, uh, Christian tradition as involving union with God. Uh, this contact with the divine is apart from the revealed word of God, the Bible. So like last sure. week we were talking, I had the pictures of uh, kind of Gnosticism I talked about in the Roman Catholic Church where God reveals himself to you. Kind of their, their distinguishing part is like, they say God reveals himself to you through the sacraments. They got more sacraments than we do, they have seven. And um, But it goes beyond the word of God. And so the sacraments kind of going beyond uh, the word of God in some ways, we would argue. Um, and then also this experience of God, seeing special visions, uh, the stigmata, uh, you know, the blood, the mark of, of Christ's wounds upon his hands, upon different saints and things like that. So then today we get to enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, can you say that with me? Enthusiasm. Yeah, these guys are so enthusiastic. It's not that kind of enthusiasm. It's, uh, it's a tricky thing here. So it's kind of hard to understand, uh, but I'll, this is what I mean here. So it's a term coined by Martin Luther that uses a German form of a technical Greek and Latin term for a person in whom the God dwells. So you have uh, N, which is the Greek, which would be in, and then Theu, which is God, is where we get theology from. So, so an enthusiast is one in whom a person believes God dwells, uh, for a person in whom the God dwells. That is a spiritist or spiritualist. It also became a general epithet for a heretic. An enthusiast is a word meaning possessed, uh, is a word meaning possessed by the God within one himself. Is a word meaning possessed by the God within oneself. Hard to articulate that properly. Uh, so an enthusiast would would kind of though they wouldn't though they would say, I'm a Christian, I believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nonetheless, the ultimate authority of of saying what's true and what's not true about God's word rests upon themselves. So, so uh, Luther would say that the enthusiasts sure. would be the Anabaptists, those who uh, baptize again, because they would say, well, I know God's word says that baptism saves, um, but I'm going to stand above that and disagree with scripture uh, because I'm an enthusiast, because I think that I stand in my authority over the written word of God. All right. Um, later on, we'll get into the small called articles and and that. So first off, I'm going to, the first video I'll hope to show you here is, how do I move this to the bottom past the dollar? If you drag it, hey, there we go. That's what he did too. Um, oh, there we go. So this is a recording from that 2019 Churchwide Assembly. Uh, as they're discussing this interfaith, a declaration of interreligious commitment. Okay. So as you watch this, have your eyes open, ears open. There's revivalism, pietism, mysticism, or enthusiasm going on. One is, amendment was submitted to the ad hoc committee. The committee expresses gratitude to the voting members, all voting members, mm -hmm. for participating in the hearings of the policy statement and for the voting members' response to the text. I want you to notice the, the nonverbals of the people in the background, this. like their body so, language. The strike line 630 to 6. This is an amendment proposed by a guy that you're going to see come to the microphone in a little bit. John 14, 6 clearly states, I 
and the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have a clear statement from Jesus, who is fully God and fully man. We do therefore have a basis to know God's views on religions that do not require faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son. The lines to be deleted are not necessary to the document and should be stricken as inconsistent with God's word, end of quote. The concerns raised by this proposed amendment were discussed and addressed at length by the full task force in the previous deliberations following the processes of review and consultation across the ELCA and with ecumenical and interreligious partners. The task force then, and this committee now, discerns that this proposed amendment should be declined for two primary reasons. First, the designated lines, which fall within a larger section entitled, <clears throat> What Lutheran Convictions Influence Our Calling, define a theological perspective drawing upon Luther's own teaching and Luther's interpretation of scripture. Second, this section undergirds a posture of curiosity and humility that we bring as we seek to learn from and engage with our inner religious neighbors. Therefore, the ad hoc committee is forwarding no recommendations to the assembly for its consideration. This completes the report from the ad hoc committee. Thank you, Bishop Wall. We've now heard the report from the ad hoc committee. The recommendations to adopt the proposed, proposed policy statement, a declaration of interreligious commitment, is before you. Microphone seven. My name is Zachary Johnson, and I'm from the Northwestern University of Minnesota. This is Matt Miles, uh, proposed amendment that was just read and discussed by Mr. Paul. Uh, I would move to amend the document entitled Declaration of Interreligious Commitment as noted in the report of the ad hoc committee, which was just on the screen, to be found in the assembly report section 5, just below the declaration. Specifically, I make up the motion and I make it to strike one 630 to 655 from the declaration. Is there a second? You may speak to the motion. Brothers and sisters, I make this motion in the defiant tradition of Martin Luther. I would like to direct everyone's attention to line 639 and 640 of the declaration, which states, I quote, we must be careful about claiming to know God's judgments regarding another religion, unquote. Brothers and sisters, God consists of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We as Christians consider that to be undeniable. The gospel, as all scripture, is God breathed. And that comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. When we consider a portion of gospel, Jesus is the speaker. What we are really considering is the text of God recording God's own statement. I am here to speak truth to power, even if it is an inconvenient truth. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do we as Lutherans need to be careful about proclaiming this message? No. Do we need to respect, care for, and love non-Christians? Absolutely yes. I submit that the best way to respect and love our neighbors is to share the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Because the language I seek to strike is plainly inconsistent with the gospel, I move to remove it from the declaration. The objection is that the truth of the gospel is inconsistent with Luther's writing, which was the response from the committee, is misguided. An honest reflection on the writings and life of Martin Luther cannot help but come to the conclusion that Luther himself would acknowledge the primacy of God's holy word over any worldly view. As Christians, can we honestly say any different? In the words of Dr. Abon from this morning, 
and our actions be a visible fulfillment of the scriptures. I will urge this assembly to repudiate and repent of any false teachings. Thank you. Microphone twelve. There's no error. Microphone ten. I'm going to stop this door. Reverend Jennifer Green, Southwest California Synod. Uh, I'd like to speak against the amendment that was just made. Um, as a Lutheran pastor, I believe in our confessions and believe in the gospel. Uh, but frankly, I am embarrassed that we are having this conversation right now in front of all of our interfaith guests. Um, our God is big enough for our family to include all of these interfaith siblings. Our God is big enough for us to admit that we do not know everything there is to know. I appreciate the uh, the work of the committee and the declaration as it stands, and I do not think that we should amend. Thank you. Microphone four. Don't jump down the Annapolis. I call the question. There's a second. Those in favor of ending debate on this amendment, please either vote in the next All right, so this one can be planned. Put out your green and red cards. But they don't, if you are in favor of ending debates now, please raise your green cards. If you're opposed, please raise your red cards. Thank you. The amendment is before us. Now, those in favor of passing this amendment, raise your green cards. If you're in favor, raise in favor of the amendment, raise your green cards. Those opposed to the amendment, your red cards. Thank you. The amendment is defeated. Before we vote on the policy statement. I invite Pastor Hunt Becker, a member of the Church Council and the Church Wide Assembly Prayer Team, to lead us in prayer. But before we do that, is there any speaking to the recommendation? Microphone 11. Bishop, I would uh, like to I'd like to move to change the rules of the Okay, so this is when it comes to an actual yeah, so vote after about 10 minutes of stalling and other things. Then it goes on for quite a while. We end up having a prayer and a song of thanksgiving afterwards, uh, too. So if you didn't catch all of that, um, in essence, this interfaith declaration uh, stated that uh, we are interfaith, the ELC is interfaith siblings with all sorts of other, not denominations, but religions. Right? And so this one representative from Northwest Minnesota got up and he said, well, this is just God, quoting God's own words. It's Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And how can, in essence, he's saying like, we, we don't believe in the God who said these words, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, if we pass this, right? And there were 23 people that voted against, against that, that interfaith statement. In that interfaith statement, it says things like this. Um, As such, mutual understanding does not diminish, but rather deepens our own faith. Luther was clear that our understanding of faith can, grow, can and does grow and change. As we experience new things in life, study, learn, and meditate and pray, hence a person's understanding can change without one's faith being undermined. By engaging our neighbors, we learn to articulate our own faith more clearly and to see in it 
things we had not noticed or appreciated before. We learned to express that being a follower of Jesus really what what being a follower of Jesus really means to us. We learned that religious differences need not erect barriers. And all of this, relying on the Holy Spirit, we experience more of the mystery of God. So you may be noticed in that statement here is that as we have conversation with our neighbors, our interfaith neighbors, then our own understanding of our faith deepens. <clears throat> so where are they saying they're going for understanding and authority? Not to God's word, but inside or through experience. Um, next paragraph says this. As we strive to show forth God's vision, we are called to work towards justice, peace, and peace for all people in creation, that is the common good. Religious diversity accompanied by mutual understanding and cooperation and enriches the whole so that you know, it's a sort of diversity message within it. So it grieves me greatly. Um, <laughs> I went to a funeral yesterday over at um, Grace Lutheran in Lake Benton for Dennis Willard Sr. Dennis Willard chiropractor in town, his dad passed away. And the pastor there had a sermon text on this verse right here that this gentleman quoted from John 14, verse 6. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the pastor had a great sermon uh, speaking of salvation through faith in, in Christ alone. So don't take, you know, this final tally in this vote to like just throw away everybody in the ELC. But I think it does give you an indication of where the, the political movement and the people making the decisions in the ELC lie. It, it really burdens my heart for the regular good faithful folk, you know, like yourself and so many of the other friends that have been led astray, you know. Um, so, so that's the first video. And I got another video here from uh, from Brian Wolfmuller. If you want to turn to your handout here, I'll just kind of give a little background of it. That might be helpful. So Wolf Miller talks about <clears throat> um, enthusiasm quite a bit. He quotes from the Small Called Articles. So the Small Called Articles are in the Book of Concord. Book of Concord is our um, uh, or a right and true exposition of God's Word. So God's Word stands above in authority uh, over us, over all things, and over the Book of Concord. And so, inasmuch as the Book of Concord agrees with Scripture, so do we agree with it. And your pastor is here to take a full, unqualified subscription to all the Book of Concord, which means when we became ordained, we said, yep, we've read the whole Book of Concord, we agree with all of it. It is a clear exposition and explanation of everything in Scripture. And so, it's our rule and guide for what we preach, what we teach, what we confess, what we do, right? So uh, here's a little background of it, and I'll just uh, sort of summarize it. You can read if you like. So the Reformation began 1517, 1530, so 13 years later, the Augsburg Confession uh, was read before Emperor Charles V, and so that was the birthday of the Lutheran Church, so June 25th, 1530, so seven, six years from now, I guess, we're going to have a big celebration for that, I'm sure, as well. Um, Later on, they're still trying to sort out the distinctions between the Lutheran understanding of Scripture and the Roman Catholic understanding and, and practice of, of Scripture as well. So uh, King Frederick the Wise, who was the elector of Saxony, had died by this time, and the guy after him was John Frederick I, and he uh, commissions Luther in December of 1536 to write up this, this uh, doctrine, uh, these articles at Small Called, uh, which is a, a town, Small Calden. And so there was illness, didn't get it written for, for about a year af afterwards. Where we at? Um, there's a bunch of different articles in it, and what we're going to be taking a look at is really towards the end of it. The third section discusses 15 articles uh, that are up for discussion between Roman Catholics and Protestants. Protestants. Subjects of sin, law, repentance, sacraments, confession, the ministry, and the definition of of the church. So it's kind of curious as to where we uh, have a, a definition or a degree, the disagreement of definition is, is there. So um, in this video from Wolf Mueller, he goes through the small called articles and what he has up on the screen you have in front of you if you want to mark it up or just for your own reference. So give me a minute as I switch videos over here. And There's this church we're doing a book study and has American Christianity failed this book I wrote a couple uh, years back in which we said that there's four theological streams that define American evangelicalism. Revivalism, pietism, mysticism, and enthusiasm. And they have three questions about enthusiasm. One, 
since the Lutherans are attacked, the external word and sacraments, are we immune to enthusiasm? Two, if we're not immune to enthusiasm, uh, how does it creep in? And three, how ought we to protect ourselves or vaccinate ourselves, guard against the dangers of enthusiasm? So we got to take up the topic of enthusiasm. And to do that, I have to beg your patience because I want to dig in, I want to have a deep dive into what I think is one of the most important theological writings outside of the New Testament. That's Martin Luther's small home articles, uh, article from part three, article eight on confession, where he talks about enthusiasm. I think this is, you, I think you're going to love it. It's going to take a little bit of patience uh, to get there. So I want to grapple with the text and uh, show you these words, these theological words from Luther, and work through them, and then come back around to those questions. Okay, so let's do it. Here is Luther. Again, this is from the small call articles. This is from small call articles where Luther's talking about confession and he brings up the topic of enthusiasm. Now look, this is, I told you it's a lot, but I think if you stick with me, you will love this. This is really fantastic. So look at, let's start with Luther. He says, those things which concern the spoken outward word, this is the external word. And he's going to say that we, we have to stick with the external word, with the spoken outward word, and anything else, uh, any other word, the, the unspoken, the secret, the silent, the inward word, that's going to be a dangerous sort of thing. So we have, to, we have to bind ourselves to the scripture. So concerning those things, we must firmly hold that God grants his spirit or grace to no one except through or with the preceding outward word. So if we want God's spirit or we want God's grace, it must be through the external word. Now this is going to be the definition of enthusiasm or the enthusiast that he's going to talk about here. And that is that they go for the inward the, let's see, inward have two ends probably. Right? The inward word not the external word, the word that's echoing in my heart, not the word that's echoing in my ear. That's the enthusiasm. Enthusiasm puts the realm of theological experience inside of us. Now, Luther says, how do we protect ourselves against the enthusiasm? Well, we've got to stick to the outward word. In order that we must be pr protected from the enthusiasts, that is, the spirits, or here it means people, teachers, the you know, uh, uh, theology teachers, spirits who boast that they have the spirit without and before the word. And accordingly, and here's the danger, if you have the spirit apart or without the word, what's the result? Is you judge, you stand as judge over the scripture or over the spoken word. If I have the spirit that's dwelling in my own heart, and that's what I'm listening to, my own feelings, my own what has it, then that actually stands above the word that's preached to me. The result of enthusiasm is having the chief thing is the word in our heart, is that now <laughs> our, uh, our heart stands over the word of God as judge and critique. And now we're looking down on God's word. We're bringing a judgment to the word of God. So the enthusiasts who boast that they have the spirit without and before the word, and accordingly, they judge the scripture or the spoken word and explain and stretch it at their pleasure. Munzer did this. He was the first Anabaptist to led this great rebellion. And so do still others at the present day who wish to be acute judges. See, there's the word. To be judges between the spirit and the letter. And yet they know not what they say or declare. So, so here, when you have the Holy Spirit, this is one of the problems that we have to uh, deal with in the charismatic church and so forth. That's the really the heritage of this radical reformation is that they stand above the word of God. They have a different word of God that comes in their own heart and now it brings a critique on the scriptures. The papacy, look what Luther says here. He says not only is it much of, the papacy is also nothing but sheer enthusiasm by which the post boasts, boasts that all rights exist in the shrine of his heart and whatever he decides and commands within the church is spirit and light, even though it is above and contrary to scripture and the spoken word. Now notice these two words here, above 
and contrary to. Now, this these are different. You can be above the scriptures and contrary to the scriptures, but if you are above the scriptures, you are going to be contrary to them. If you are standing as judge over the Lord's word, then you're going to resist it. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to be above it or contrary to it. Now, this is the claim that, that the Pope makes and still makes today, that he uh, has the final authority to judge doctrine. Now, what Luther is pushing, this is really quite good, is that the problem with the Anabaptists is enthusiasm, the problem with the papacy is enthusiasm, and he's going to go on to say the problem with every false doctrine is that it's all enthusiasm. It's all the human heart, human reason, human experience, human emotions, human whatever, standing above God's word. All this is the old devil and serpent who converted Adam and Eve into enthusiasts. Now look at this. So the devil is always trying to make us into enthusiasts like he did with Adam and Eve. Now how did he do that with Adam and with Eve? He led them from the outward word of God, do not eat of the tree, to spiritualizing and self-conceit. So when Eve saw that the fruit was good for food and, and helpful to make one wise, see, it was, it was a selfish sort of thing, that, that now they were led away from the outward word of God in the intelligible mind and to their own judgment. Uh, and, and they went and they took the fruit and they ate. Now Luther's going to make this point, and this is for him kind of a constant irony, that how does the devil lead us away from the outward word? He does it through other outward words. So how does the devil, how does the devil teach us out of the Bible? He has his own anti-Bible. He has his own anti-word. He has his own anti-preaching. Just as Luther says, our enthusiasts of the present day condemn the outward word, nevertheless they themselves are not silent, but they fill the word with their cravings and their writings, as though indeed the Spirit could not come through the writings and spoken words of the apostles, but must come first through their writings and words and so forth. This is really, this is really great. Luther says, well, if God's word can, if the Holy Spirit can work without the word of God, why don't you guys just be quiet? Why do you have to speak through them? But sure enough, they fill the words with their writings and so forth. Why do they not omit their own sermons and their writings until the Spirit himself come to men without their writings and before them, as they boast he has come to them without the preaching of the scriptures? So this is, oops, that should be one. So that Luther says, if, if the Holy Spirit's going to come without the word, why don't you guys just shut up? Now, there is a church that's actually take that advice. That's the quiz that they sit around the Holy Spirit waiting to move to someone like this. But generally, the devil is always using the preaching of the word, of his words, to lead us away from the words. But of these matters, there is not time to dispute at greater length. We have elsewhere sufficiently urged the subject. Now, I want to urge on you where Luther has urged the subject, and it is in his writing against the heavenly prophets. Oh boy, I wish I could publish that for you. It's, uh, there's no public domain version of it. Against the Heavenly Prophets. There's no public domain version of it. I'm waiting. I want to get one so I, we can publish this. I think this is one of the most important uh, writings of Luther, especially dealing with enthusiasm. Okay, he continues. For even those who believe before baptism, now he's going to make an argument that the Holy Spirit comes through the word. Even those who believe before baptism will become believing in baptism, believe through the preceding outward word. Oh, is that outward word? That's orange thing. And the adults who come to reason must first affirm, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, even though they are at first unbelieving and receive the spirit of baptism ten years later. Cornelius, Acts 10, heard long before among the Jews of the coming of the Messiah. Let me see uh, through whom he was righteous before God, and in such faith his prayers and alms were acceptable to God, as Luke calls them, the gods and God fearing. And without such preceding word and fearing, he could not, he could not have believed or been righteous. St. Peter had to reveal him that the Messiah, in whom is the one to come, he had hitherto believed, had now come, lest his faith concerning the coming Messiah hold him captive among the hardened and unbelieving Jews, but know that he was now to be saved by the present Messiah, who must not, but the battle of the Jews, deny or persecute him. So here he says, well, people would say, well, what about Cornelius? 
He didn't, he didn't, uh, he became a believer and he didn't have the external word and he was just not certain that he did. Now, this is, I want you to prepare yourselves because here comes perhaps the most insightful, as far as I can see, the most insightful text or, or writing, again, outside the scripture. Look at what Luther says. In a word, enthusiasm adheres with Adam and his children from the beginning of the, from the first fall, from the beginning of the world to the end of the world. It's poison having been implanted and infused into them, that is, into us, by the old dragon. And it is the origin, power, life, and strength of all heresy, especially that of the papacy and of Mohammed. That's Islam. So that, so that Luther says that the root of every false doctrine, of every false teaching, the root of the sin of Adam and Eve alone, is enthusiasm. Therefore, we ought to and must constantly maintain this point, that God does not wish to deal with us otherwise than through the spoken word and the sacraments. It is the devil himself, and whatsoever is extolled as spirit, without the word and sacraments. For God wished to appear even with Moses through the burning bush and the spoken word. And no prophet, neither Elijah nor Elisha, received the spirit without the Ten Commandments or the spoken word. Without the word, the outward word, however, they were not holy, much less would the Holy Ghost have moved them to speak when they were still unholy or profane. For they were holy, as he says, since the Holy Ghost spake through them. So that the word of God, the external word of God, is what saves us and makes us holy, and brings the Holy Spirit. Always the devil is trying to do the other, to do, to give the other way around. We have first the scriptures, which bring to us the forgiveness of sin and the and the and the blessings of Jesus and the holiness of God, which then echoes into our own hearts. But always the devil is trying to reverse it and put our own hearts, our own reason, or our own judgment above the word of God. And that move is enthusiasm. That's what it is, to, 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 to bring truth from the scriptures into our own hearts, or to make our, ourselves the judges of what's true or what's not. Now, thanks for sticking with me on that, because I think that's helpful for answering the question. So the first question is, can um, enthusiasm still show up in the Lutheran church? The answer is yes. I mean, it's, it, no matter how Luther says it, it sticks to all of us. It's, it's Part of the venom, it's, it's the it's enthusiasm is like the default theological operating system that our sinful flesh is born with. We're always exalting ourselves among the scriptures. Now, how the second question is, how do we recognize it? And in a lot of different ways, but it's basically whatever you put above the scriptures. If you put like liberalism, where's that? Liberalism puts reason uh, above the scriptures. That's that's one way to do it. Or you have uh, mysticism, which puts our own experience above the scriptures. God told me, or God spoke for me. Or, you know, everyone's praying for an individual word from God. That's a, that's a form of enthusiasm. There's Epicureanism, which puts our pleasure above the scriptures. And, and Luther mentioned the Pope and Muhammad and all these. Anything that, when we, when we say, hey, when, when the devil puts God's word in conflict with our wants or our desires or our thoughts or our experiences or the things we see, we're tempted to put all of these above the scriptures, and that's enthusiasm. So the third question is, what's the solution? And Luther gives this in his uh, essay, uh, Against the Heavenly Prophets, he gives this great line there. He says, the word, the word, the word. we got to always go back to the scriptures. What does God's word say? It, it is, his word is what uh, it gives us the truth. And so we always have to have our nose in the Bible. We have to be studying the scriptures to see what the Lord uh, wants us to know, that, what he wants us to do, what he sends to us. And we have to let that reign in our hearts and in our minds. That these things, all that we are, our mind and our strength and our experience and our reason, all of that stands underneath the scriptures, in service to the scriptures, in love for God and for the neighbor. And that's the anti-enthusiasm. Now this battle is in each one of us, it's in each one of our churches, it's in every church, every person, every family, the battle against enthusiasm will remain until at last the Lord rescues us from this body of death by our own death and resurrection. So, so enthusiasm is a persistent and pernicious danger. It's why it's good to know the name of it, to know what it's about, and to know how to recognize it and to start to fight against it. May God help us do this.
Well, thanks for the question. I can get you in the book. Thanks for the next one. Uh, if you're interested, there's more. But... All right. So that's the uh, end of our video, and I think the end of our study here. So, you know, I started with the title of Eyes to See, and it's not terribly profound, but if you keep your nose in Scripture, and you keep Scripture above your heart and above your mind, above your reason, you'll be all right. Give them eyes to see and confidence in the faith. So let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, now people can go because we're at time. But if you want to, because you got to go play. You got to go. Play. No, not today. Oh, no. No cribbage today with Dean? You said he beat you five out of six times. I <laughs> said <laughs> you got to come back. At it. All right, go ahead, Dean. Yeah. I was reading through the Lutheran witness in about the seminary uh, yeah. for help and found very familiar that at that point they were looking at understanding the word and they're trying to uh, you know move it uh, above you know have their understanding and then the word versus this way again. So it's just kind of clicked as, as he was talking. Yeah, and that's why, you know, 50 years ago, that was a contention over Seminex, was the, the battle for the Bible, uh, because it was the higher critical method was being taught, which really put man's reason above Scripture. So the Scripture down here, your head above it, your reason above it. And, you know, the, oh, the church was saved at that time by faithful laymen and laywomen, you know, because the pastors in the seminary, at least one seminary in St. Louis, had had gone that direction of putting their reason above scripture. And I think that's important, you know, so history doesn't repeat itself. Yep. 50 years from now, it might be there again. And so teaching and, and providing this information is, is good. Jeff suggested that we do a, a month of, you know, one of these lunch and learns for a month on seminars. And I got I got a big file in my office of all my mom's original files from 50 years ago when she was battling to keep her church Missouri Synod. So I'm looking forward to that. Maybe we'll do it in the month of May or something. How do you, you 